This is a two-part Halloween special, so if you haven't watched the first part, head on over to Game vs. Games channel. Listen, I can't thank you enough for your help here. You really gave me the guidance to get through Resident Evil for PlayStation and Saturn. Well, I suppose we can dive a little deeper into this game, but wait a minute, isn't it almost Halloween? Well, yeah. It's the perfect time to talk about games like this. Why do you ask? Well, you may not see this that much on your Game vs. Game channel, but on my channel, Halloween is an especially strange time of the year for me. I've been chased by Dracula twice, had my wallet stolen, and had to dress like Fiona from Haunting Ground because I lost a bet. You know, for such a big fan of Halloween, it's becoming a time of the year I'm beginning to dislike. Oh yeah, I remember when you cross-dressed. Cosplayed? If you say so. What is that though, three years in a row? Three strikes and you're out, man. That's baseball. Come on, don't be such a girl. Sorry. Listen, I don't think anything bad's gonna happen four years in a row. What is the worst that could happen? Yeah, I suppose you're right. Well, I guess we should hit start and become the masters of Resident Evil Remake. What the? Resident Evil is the game that gave birth to not only an entire franchise, but evolved the survival horror genre into what it is today. While it took inspiration from games like Sweet Home and Alone in the Dark, the game's B-movie style romp through a mansion infested with zombies was a welcome addition to any gamer's library of games. In 2001, Nintendo released the GameCube, a small, cube-shaped system. This powerhouse had some stellar first-party titles, but Nintendo struggled to bring in third parties to release exclusives to their console. Re-enter Capcom, a company that brought their popular non-Nintendo franchise, Resident Evil, to the big end. First with an impressive yet late port of Resident Evil 2 on the Nintendo 64. Development had also begun on Resident Evil Zero before it shifted over to the GameCube. Zero, along with the fourth entry in the series, Resident Evil 4, were part of a three-game exclusivity agreement that Nintendo signed with Capcom, bringing the mature-rated series completely into Nintendo's welcoming arms. The third game of the deal was a remake of the original Resident Evil, dubbed by fans as Remake, a clever play on the name of the series using the first letters of each word. This is a game that Nintendo fans hadn't experienced unless they jumped ship to the first release on either the Sega Saturn or the Sony PlayStation. The development began because Shinji Mikami, the series creator, didn't feel that the original release held up to the newer generation's standards. He wanted to craft a game that fleshed out the original release, trying to remain faithful to the core mechanics and story, but improving upon it. So does Remake breathe new life into the series while still remaining faithful enough to the original? Starting the game, you have your choice between two characters just like in the original, Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine. Chris and Jill are both members of a police force called STARS, or depending on the game you're playing, either Special Tactics and Rescue Squad or Special Tactics and Rescue Service. Chris and Jill are members of Alpha Team, along with Albert Wesker and Barry Burton. Alpha Team are sent to follow up the investigation of a series of brutal murders happening in a Midwestern place called Raccoon City. The first group that went in, Bravo Team, lost contact, and so it's up to Chris, Jill, and the rest of the gang to find out what happened but they quickly have their world turned completely upside down as they head into a nearby mansion after being attacked. Seeing the carnage outside, their coward pilot Brad Vickers leaves them in the dust. Their only hope is looking for shelter from wild monster dogs that attack them, taking up the potential horrors that lurk in the mansion. Who are you people? Those things are everywhere. Rebecca, I think we can take them one-on-one -on -one if we filter them into the house and search everywhere for ammo. 
Hi, so I'm Rebecca, that's Barry, you're gonna be a member of STARS now, there you go, and um, we're looking for bullets. Do, do you have bullets? Please tell me you have bullets! What is going on? I have no idea. We need your help to defeat this evil horde of people who died and came back to life. Why won't you just say zombie? Don't say the Z word! Will you help us? We'll do our best. Right, Eric? <sighs> Eric? Eric? Right away, you'll notice that the live-action cutscenes are absent from this version, as are the cheesy introductions of the characters from the original. Remake offers players the chance to experience a much more frightening game that not only has its fair share of jump scares, but also disturbs with wild visual imagery and vivid use of graphical power. It steals from all aspects of horror genres to give off a well-rounded survival horror experience. Though this game also has pre-rendered backgrounds similar to the first few original titles in the series, Remake features 3D rendered models that use motion capture technology based on real models, along with extremely impressive particle effects and rendered layers of things like water trickling down in the background, tree branches swaying in the distance, or shadows of flames flickering against the walls. The character models themselves are equally impressive here, with the GameCube really showcasing its graphical prowess with lifelike renderings of the characters. I like to view the controls as an improvement from the original. The 180 degree pivot movement is especially helpful here. Holding the opposite direction you are facing and pressing the B button, Jill or Chris will turn around quickly, allowing for quick escapes and simpler navigation. You move with the analog stick in a tank-like motion similar to the first title, though you can also use the GameCube's tiny D-pad as well. There are a few different control schemes available as options, so choose whichever one suits your needs. If you go with the default option, you hold B to run, holding the right trigger and pressing Pressing the A button attacks with whatever weapon you have equipped. You have a menu accessible with the Y button. You'll spend a large majority of your time here, along with the map, which can be accessed either with the Z button or by going into the menu. The menu allows for a bit of breathing room from potential death as you can reload weapons, examine items picked up for clues, as well as combine items. Health is still the same, with blue herbs curing poison and green curing regular wounds, and red being able to be combined with green for stronger healing. There's also first aid spray canisters that can refill your life completely. There's a few different levels of health that can affect your player. Green being full health, yellow and orange for slightly hurt, and red for danger or close to death. If you are poisoned by some enemies, you'll have to heal with a blue herb or else your life will continue to drain unless you constantly heal. The game has two initial choices of difficulty that go against traditional norms. Would you rather mountain climb or hike? Wait, what? Well, to summarize, mountain climbing results in characters that take damage more realistically and reach quicker levels of pain more frequently. It also means that the survival horror elements fully come out to play, as there is less ammunition and health available. This is pretty much requiring several times where running away is your only option. The hiking route provides players the ability to get through the game much easier, with an abundance of ammo and health and attacks that do way more damage. Lure them over to you. I'll pick off any stragglers. Remember, aim for their heads. Hey, Eric. Are you there? Whew, I am here. But boy, I had the strangest dream that Barry and Rebecca from Resident Evil were in your living room. Wow, oh, that's really going on. Good, I'm not crazy. So, Barry, Rebecca, what do we do? How can we help? Beat the game and the zombies will disappear. It's just that simple. Challenge accepted. There are some new gameplay elements that add additional challenge to the game, such as the Crimson Heads. These are much harder zombies to kill than the ones you'll see shuffling about normally. These guys can run, as well as do more damage thanks to their sharpened claws and quickened pace. They are much harder to kill. And if you don't burn the regular zombies' bodies, they can turn into crimson heads when you come back later. You're given a lighter as Chris, but as Jill, you find the lighter. Using a canister of gas that you can refill at different rooms of the game, Jill or Chris can use the lighter with the gas in hand to burn zombies who are playing dead. This is a huge advancement that a lot of players did not exploit. In fact, I missed it during my original playthrough when the game came out. 
Now of course, just like the original, you'll save your game at the typewriters found around the mansion and surrounding grounds using an ink ribbon each time you do, which also have to be found and picked up around the mansion and take up an inventory slot just like everything else. Thankfully, you'll find safe rooms throughout the game with item boxes that are interconnected between rooms. Right, but you can definitely cycle through items much faster in Remake. You can also open up the item box much faster by double tapping the A button. Why is that worth noting? I just really like that idea of saving time. Shame then, since you'll be spending, and I believe the technical term is shloads of time managing your inventory, especially if you're playing as Chris. I actually find that planning out how I'm going to approach items is more fun during multiple playthroughs of the game, and oddly enough, certain characters are given bigger advantages than others. Really? How so? Well, with Jill, you get 8 slots for inventory, whereas Chris is only given 6. So to me, playing as Jill, no matter the level of difficulty you pick, is going to be easier as you have more room to store items. However, with each playthrough, you begin to memorize what items you need when you get to a certain spot, so bringing a ton of guns and ammo when you need to make room for special items might not be apparent during your first time through. You begin to adapt memorizing the mansion's layout and the puzzles, and despite certain slight differences in in each character's playthrough, you'll get the gist of what needs to be done. This also encourages players to run through multiple playthroughs thanks to tons of unlockables. While the original game also focused on multiple playthroughs, in Remake, there are even more unlockable costumes to grab, special weapons to unlock, a mode where all the enemies are invisible, along with an even harder difficulty mode. The game is tailor-made for multiple playthroughs, so memorization is key. The faster you can get through the mansion, the better the rewards are. Ah, right, I gotcha. However, you're memorizing the remakes item locations, which, much like the advanced or arranged mode of the PS1 Director's Cut, many are in different locations from the original. That's right, so if you got cozy with the original, forget everything you know, as Remake throws in several new rooms and puzzles. Because of this, you'll spend time venturing into the unknown rooms, unsure of what you'll find. You might need to grab bullets that you don't have room for, or you may opt to using a health item just to free up a slot in your inventory for an important item. While I get that this is survival horror, Remake tends to make players hurry back to save rooms to dump items they don't need, just so they can run back to grab something they found they actually need to progress. Whew. Man, can you imagine if they didn't make the item boxes sync up together? That would be total chaos. That's actually an unlockable option. Jeez, talk about brutal. No, that's brutal. The voice acting in Remake is miles better than the original title. Stop it. Don't open that door! Well, let me clarify. I'm nostalgic for Jill Sandwich jokes, Master of Unlocking lines, and... Well, everything Barry says to you. I can't help but wonder about a few choice scenes that are not only unrealistic, they just seem way out of sync with the rest of the game. Spoilers ahead, so jump ahead to this point here if you don't want to be spoiled. My biggest gripe with the story in this revision is a couple of plot holes and details that kind of fall through the cracks. Playing through Jill's storyline, Chris goes missing when the group enters the mansion, and Barry and Wesker are left to find out what happens. Barry initially helps you out, leaving you weapons and ammo, and fixing doorknobs that break. But we learn that Barry is led to believe his family is being held by Umbrella, the company behind the virus that infected all these scientists and created all the monsters that now roam free. Wesker uses him as a puppet to try to take out Jill before she gets too close. But after one of the enemies is defeated, there's no discussion regarding Barry pointing a gun at Jill. It's not like anything was behind her that he needed to shoot at, so it should have been pretty clear to Jill that he betrayed her. They ride down in an elevator together shortly afterwards in complete silence. You don't find out about Barry's family until you finally meet up with Wesker, so there's this chunk of time where Jill is completely complacent about Barry almost killing her. The elevator ride was a golden opportunity for the developers to flesh out what happened and make this information known for better storytelling, but unfortunately they completely pass it up. It's a bit jarring, and it kind of takes me out of the experience because of it. The acting here, while an overall improvement in quality, still has room for improvement. Sometimes conversations feel very natural and flow well, but other times things feel very disjointed or a bit hammy. I can appreciate the appeal of cheesy horror lingo, but I guess I'm just too nostalgic of the original release's ridiculous voice acting. Oh, Barry! That was too close. 
You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. <clears throat> Phew. Barry. That was a close one. A second late, you would have fit nicely into a sandwich. It's just not the same. It's missing that B-movie, so bad it's good quality. You said it. Last, we have a clip where Rebecca cries out and Chris hears it, prompting him to go investigate. He finds Rebecca curled up in a ball against the door while a hunter enemy is seconds from attacking her. After defeating it, what follows is a scene that leaves me baffled. Wouldn't it make more sense to stick together at this point? I realize this is done so that the game continues on its solitary confinement path, but I feel like this scene would have made more sense if it was right before the ending. I understand the idea of a flawed protagonist, but she goes up against something way worse towards the end of the game. You would think she would do something other than cower here. And use your better judgment. Got it? I can handle myself. And of course the big changes from the original don't stop there. Tell the good people about the enhanced map functionality and expanded story. Ah, right. So, when you are looking at the map, you'll notice green rooms and red rooms. Green are fully explored and red still have items in them. Pressing up or down allows you to see the different levels in the part of the map that you're in, but pressing left or right lets you scroll through the various maps you've collected. There's the main mansion, the courtyard which also houses an altar and a helipad, the residence where the scientists at the mansion lived, the aqua ring, and laboratory. One of the newer areas involves a walk through a woodland area and a cabin where you come across a woman wearing what appears to be a bag over her head. She knocks you out cold and when you awaken, she's gone. I don't want to give everything away, but she has an integral part of the story that adds a more sympathetic zombie to the cast. A family experimented on, a young girl who loses her parents and becomes a monster that cannot be hurt with bullets. Speaking of weapons, the guns are different for each character. Jill gets a handgun, shotgun, and a grenade launcher that can shoot fire, grenade, or acid rounds. She can get the magnum as well. Chris can have all of these except for the grenade launcher, but he does get access to a flamethrower later in the game. Ammo is scattered all over the mansion, and though sometimes it's pretty obvious thanks to a blinking shimmer on the screen, sometimes it's harder to spot items. There's also emergency evasion weapons that the two characters can use, and they add a nice spice to the standard point and shoot tactics. Sure, you can shoot every zombie you see, but you can also shoot them until they fall, then slice at them with the knife. But the emergency evasion weapons are super fun to use. While they both can use a dagger, Jill gets access to a stun gun and Chris shoves a flash grenade in their mouth, allowing for maximum damage when shot. So I gotta ask, where's Chris? And Jill? We're not sure where Chris is. Let me see if I can get Jill's attention. Jill, are you close? We're surrounded, you can really use your help. We're at some nerd's house. Hey! Jill, 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 Jill. If you're playing as Chris, he comes in contact with Rebecca Chambers, a member of the Delta team that never responded. She is able to mix medicines and heal your wounds if you see her in the save room. Are you okay? Want me to treat your wounds? You know, that scene could lead into something entirely different with the right kind of music. <laughs> this room is equipped with all sorts of medical supplies. Want me to treat your wounds? Yeah, would you? Zelda 2, eat your heart out. Jill, 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 come on, Jill, Jill. While combat in the game is a huge improvement over the original, one frustrating thing that hasn't changed is the camera angles. Remake likes to create dynamic camera angles which add to the fear factor of the game. Some of these are downright eerie and disturbing, and while artistically I appreciate the added element of terror, gameplay-wise the camera is still a mess. When your character is running or shooting, the camera will shift to the next room thanks to the single shot screen. Unlike in later games where the camera moves with you, you're forced to memorize where each camera camera is so you can create a seamless interruption of motion. The problem I have with this is that it can force your character out of frame while shooting an enemy, causing a disjointed mess during travel and combat. It may be a serious staple in these early games, but I've always disliked it. This is also a very dark game too, so stick to playing it at night with all the lights off. Jill, God damn it, I can hear you chewing, Jill! 
The puzzles are mostly common sense, especially if you've played the original or any others in the series. It's mostly involving having the right item at the right location to open locked doors or areas. But one in particular that I wanted to discuss is the Vigil puzzle. See, in Jill's storyline, she comes across a room that has a bunch of chemicals required to make a chemical called Vigil that will kill the base portion of a toxic plant, making it much easier to kill later on. After gathering all of the documents and clues, Jill puts together the chemical, goes to the spot where she needs to use it, and voila, no more root of evil plant. Right, I remember this one. It's pretty engaging trying to piece everything together, and once you've found all the key information, it makes sense. Exactly, but during Chris's playthrough, he is apparently not good with reading as no matter what you do, you can't make the chemicals. But depending on certain aspects of the storyline that occur, you may trigger a scene where Rebecca will show up and take the information from Chris in order to make the Vigil herself. This gives you the ability to play as Rebecca in a kind of ultra survival mode where her goal is to create the Vigil. You also have to have Rebecca play the Moonlight Sonata for you in order to open up a secret area of the piano room. I'll give you that, it's a bit on the unintuitive side, especially if Rebecca doesn't show up. That being said, I actually love when games provide different paths and different solutions to the same puzzle. It's not so much that it's a different path, it's just the fact that Chris's playthrough is that much harder because I did all the right things I was supposed to do. The choices you make regarding saving certain characters or letting them die, or if you waste too much time doing a specific task, can cause serious ramifications, more so with Chris's storyline than Jill's. I guess I'm just frustrated because I know how to solve the puzzle with all the materials, but the game's narrative is putting up a brick wall. But, nah, different strokes, I suppose. What is she even eating? Come on! There's not much to get excited about regarding the music in this game. Though the original game had music that didn't exactly fit in with the game's atmosphere, most of the tracks here are ambient, suspenseful bursts of music, along with just background noise like trees and wind and occasional howling when outside. It all fits in with the experience, but it's not something to listen to outside of the game, aside from that save room music. Man, I can listen to that all day. Yeah. Barry, look! Play faster, you two! So, among the twists and turns in the game, it all sticks fairly close to the plot of the original, aside from a few choice scenes we talked about earlier. Once you find out who the real mastermind is, you face off against the tyrant, and wow, does he go down pretty quickly with the right guns. Now, it's worth mentioning that you're most likely walking out of there with at least one of your team, but it all depends on how you play the game. There's so many different variables as to how you can experience Resident Evil. And once the game is finished, there's tons to keep you busy. If you, the master of unlocking, enjoy this game enough to play through it multiple times, you're sure to find tons of unique and interesting ways to experience this classic title. It's also worth noting that the game has a port on the Wii with controls that are supposedly improved, though I've yet to experience this version myself. There's also a high definition port of the game that came out for newer gen systems, and while the game gets a much better boost in lighting along with smoother rendering of the 3D models, I guess I'm still more impressed in the technical marvel running on the GameCube. There's also a little nod to the little cube that could in the laboratory when you have to use the MO discs in these boxes that look very familiar. After defeating Tyrant, you make your way to the helipad where Brad finally shows up to rescue you after you shoot some signal flares into the sky. Finally is right, but you know the horror tropes, the bad guy doesn't quite want to stay dead. Right, and after taking down Tyrant, the mansion blows up as you escape and you are safe. For now, <laughs> Resident Evil Remake is a stellar survival horror experience that adds plenty to the original. While I can't help but remember my times playing through the original and cringing at the hilariously bad dialogue, I still feel that this is the best example of how to remake a classic that set the groundwork for a, no pun intended, game changer. Despite Remake continuing to have the camera angles at tough spots, this version amps up the enjoyment during combat and puzzles and is one of the most gorgeous titles on the GameCube that is still awe-inspiring to this day. This is a game that every survival horror fan, Resident Evil nut, and GameCube owner should have in their collection. Oh, and it's also worth noting that Resident Evil is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Happy birthday, Resident Evil! We did it! Hey, yeah, they're gone! 
See what I'm talking about? When it comes to Halloween, stuff gets crazy. <laughs> yeah, you were not kidding. You sure do know how to show a guy a good time, Mike Tendo. This was fun. Agreed, Eric. Now if you'll excuse me, watch out, a zombie! Yeah! Gotcha. I hope you enjoyed this year's Halloween special. Check out the video on the left hand side which is last year's Halloween special. And if you happen to not watch the first part of this video, remember you can watch it on the right hand side. Just go ahead and click that link. Again, thanks so much for watching and happy Halloween.